something down wrong as well. Looks like we're missing two people now. Hmm. Okay. Okay, so you should be able to do that. Now, let's talk about error checking. Let's assume for a second that I was going to send you this stream of data. Well, in binary, I'll just put each of these on their own line. There's a four, there's a two, there's a six, there's an F, there's a six, there's a two, a two, zero, three, four, three, seven, uh, dog, alpha. Okay, check me please and make sure I got them all right. 42, 6, F, 6, 2, 2, 0, 3, 4, three, seven, zero dog, zero alpha. Looks like I, if I got the other part right, I got those right. Now, if I was gonna send you that, that's quite a few bits. You know, it's however many characters, and this is just a short little for, uh, expression we sent here. So one of the things we have to realize is that when we're sending these characters, they normally, because we're in ASCII, We've only added that first character so we could read them as nibbles. We may or may not be sending that particular bit. Now, how many lines do we have there? We have eight lines times seven, that's 56 characters. Well, that's quite a bit to send and assume that no error is going to occur. So I'm going to send these characters using ASCII in modern times, mostly between circuit boards. Not, it will not be between uh, you know, distant computers because we have other protocols for that these days. But ASCII is still used very pervasively and will continue to show up for many, many years. But one of the things that happens is in a transmission, we often have data errors meaning that, you know, something happens on the wire, some old magnetic or electrical confusion happens, and a bit will get changed. For example, instead of us sending in uh, the first case here, a, uh, you know, 100010, we might actually send another one there. So instead of sending a bob, we use the third letter of the alphabet, which was C, so Cobb. The guy would get hungry for corn when he saw it. And that would be you know, a very disappointing message because we intended to be in Bob. And in any of these seven-bit clusters, it would be nice if we would be able to handle an error on any single bit. Now, it'd be nice if we could handle errors on many bits, but we can't easily in ASCII using the techniques we're going to be using now because and they're the more pervasive ones. So what we're going to do is we're going to take and we're going to send an additional bit at the beginning. And for the moment, I'm just going to mark it as X. And we're going to call that bit the parity bit. Oops. I was chatting there for a minute, all those capital letters. So parity. Parity bit is a bit that we add to enhance our ability to detect that there has been a single bit error in one of the parts of the 8-bit uh, or 7-bit entity that we're trying to transmit you know, entropy and sense and real valid information. Now, later on in other things, or other codes, for example, in um, your credit card, 
as a code. The last digit of your credit card number is a code which has been computed based on all the other digits. And if they, when they recomputed, don't match, then they know the credit card number has been misread. And it'll cause a misread. It also is a little stronger than a single parity bit because it can handle multiple bit corrections. Our problem is, what would happen if we changed two bits? Well, we would have an error, but we're gonna see that this will not be able to detect that we had an error if two bits are wrong inside of a single seven bit entity. So we're gonna use parity and we're gonna use the eighth bit in order to contain the parity. Now there are several types of parity and we should know these. None, which means we don't use parity at all. The bit may or may not be there. We're going to be able to use something called space parity, something called mark parity, or even parity, and odd parity. Now, the first one will allow us on machines that can do it to be able to only send seven bits in a group. We don't worry about there being eight bits. The receiver knows it's only going to get seven and it knows what to do with that missing eight bit on its own. Space parity, and when we have uh, no parity, it basically says we can put anything we want in that position if we send eight bits. But if we send seven bits, that position doesn't even exist. Space parity says, Always make that bit a zero when you send it. The term space when referring to ASCII data or serial communications means zero. So what we've been writing now for all of our characters is basically something in space parity. We haven't been putting any high order bits on. Mark parity, you might well imagine, says take the first bit and always send a one. Now, if we were to take those characters and look at them, we have Charlie two, we have Echo Fox, we have Echo two, we have Alpha zero, we have uh, B4, B7, we have 8D and we have 8A. So these are ASCII characters as well. You might be asked someday to write the word Bob using mark parity. Well, we know what Bob is, it's right here. But that's using mark parity. This is Bob using space parity. Either one of them are acceptable as ways of producing no parity or none parity. Additionally, we could mix them. We could go 42EF62. We could go 42EFE2. We go C26F62. Any combination of these characters would be valid if we were doing no parity. If we're doing no parity, but we're only sending seven bits, we always make the assumption that the missing bit is a zero. So it looks exactly the same when we write it down as space parity. Notice that none of these three helped us at all with errors. The only thing they do kind of help is when we know it's space parity, we have to make sure that we always have a space when we receive it in the first position. So that gives us a one out of eight chance that that's where the error would have been. The error could have been somewhere else. Now even parity is a little more useful. Even parity says, Take the seven bits you have. Let's get rid of these again. Count the number of ones you have. If the number you get is even, make that a zero. So I have an even number, right? One, one. There's two bits on, that's even. So I make this a zero. In this case, I have six bits on. That's an even number. Make that a zero. In this case, I have one, two, three bits on. In order to make it even, 
that needs to be a one. I have one bit on here that's odd. Make it even. One, two, three. Make it even. Five. Make it even. Three. Make it even. I have two bits that's already even, so I make that a zero. So what do we have? We have 4, 2, 6, F, E, F, E, 2. I'm sorry, e, uh, I'm reading the character wrong. We have 4, 2, 6, F, E, 2, A, 0, B, 4, B, 7, 8, dog, 0a. Now, how does this actually work? Well, it turns out when we send the characters, we send them in reverse order. So that last thing down there would be sent 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. Then we compute the parity and send the parity. So if we took this row right here and we were going to send it, we would send 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. We compute, we have an odd parity, we need one more to make it even. And that's what would get sent. So if we're sending it, we may send it in reverse order. We may also have some extra bits, and we'll talk about that in another class. But the parity is computed last. Now the guy that receives it, he receives a one, a zero, a one, a one, a zero, zero, zero. He says to himself, I have an odd number, I better receive a one. If he receives a one, the character was good. If he receives a zero, he throws an exception back to the sender and says, resend that character. I didn't receive it correctly. Now, we can't fix it. All we can do is detect it. Now, had we received it and it was in this order, both bits have been flipped, we still have an even number. We can't check it. We would just simply receive the wrong value. So we're basing it on the fact that single bit errors happen much more frequently than double bits or triple bit or quadruple bit. And we can detect single bit errors, but we can't correct them. And we can't detect you know, even bit number of errors, like two or four. OK, so the other case, obviously, is odd parity. Odd parity does the same thing we just did, except we always set the first bit such that it makes an odd number. We have two bits on right now. We're using odd parity. We need to add one to make it an odd number. We have six on, put one on to make it an odd number. We have three on already, make that a zero. We have one on, make that a zero. We have three on, make that a zero. We have five on, make that a zero. We have three on, Make that a zero. We have two on. We need it to be odd. Make that a one. Whoops, not a two, a one. Not a two, one. And that would be an example of odd parity. We do the same thing. We send it. Last thing we receive is the parity bit. In the case of both of these, this would have been a one. This guy would have, or here would have been a zero, but I think I've already reversed the. Uh, ordering of those two bits. I think they were zero, 01, so make them zero, 00 to match. That's an odd number. We see we had an even number. So we don't need a bit here. We did need a bit there, which is why we set them. So we write them down. So if somebody said to you, how do you do Bob with odd parity? Well, Bob is the first three characters here, right? With odd parity. So you'd say it was Charlie 2, Echo Fox 6, 2. Anybody have any questions? Okay, give me a little green light there if you're happy. How does it give me red if you're not? How do you uh, do the, the green thing? How do you do what? How do you put the, the green marker or whatever? The, uh, the, 
Go ask that question in chat and somebody will tell you. Okay. Okay, so let's see what would be more exciting than parity. Ah, Unicode. How could we get more exciting than that? Okay, let's take a character. I don't know. One. Oh, I just hit some button that's going to open a help window somewhere. One. F632. There we go. That would be a good character. Now, I have no idea whether I think I actually do know that that's a real character. Let's go look and see. So if I if I had said that, I have a code point, 1F632. To find that, you would go to the web, to our web page, to unicode.org, enter that in the find the chart. To go, it'll leave you a list of pages that used to be on. Go to that page. Now you can either look it up or you can do a find window, pop that number in the find window and you'll get two hits. One, a picture of it and secondly, what it is. So we'll jump down to its picture and then down to its name. So its name is Astonished Face. So it looks like that. Okay. So astonished face. Uh, that could be a question sometime is what is the actual name of code point 1F632? So we're going to have to encode astonished face. Now, last time we learned a couple things. We learned there are some encodings. Don't forget, here, here's a term you got to remember on this, right? This thing is a code point. This is not an encoding. If you were literally going to start and list all the code points that are possible, you'd start with the number zero and you'd go all the way up to one zero F, 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 which is the largest code point in Unicode. So that's like a bazillion characters, right? But the code points themselves have to be encodable, meaning that we have to be able to pass them around and understand what they are in a particular encoding. We learn several encodings. We learn UF, UTF-32, two forms. We learn big end to end, UTF-32, little end to end. We learn UTF-16, big end to end, UTF-16, little end to end. And we learn UTF-8 encoding. Now, there's a bunch of other encodings. There actually are some other variations of UTF-32 that I'm not going to teach you. But what we have to do is we have to be able to take whatever code point we have, tell the user who's going to receive this code point that when we give it to you, it will be in this encoding, or that encoding, or this encoding, or that encoding, or this encoding. We know that UTF-16 is the code encoding for languages like Java and C Sharp and various other programming languages. We know that UTF-8 is the encoding for HT, well, HTML5, basically the web, the modern web uses UTF-8. And so we have a little thing here. One of the reasons we don't stick everything in 32 bits, because this guy here, if we count the bits, is 21 bits long, is that there would be a lot of wasted bits, right? We use only 21 out of every 32 bits, particularly on small machines, ones that don't have a lot of memory. We're wasting a lot of space to encode those zeros. So although it could be encoded here and although the language could ultimately grow to 32 bits, we have reasonably sure it's not going to grow much bigger than this in you know, the next 10 years. So there's some reasons why it can't having to do with how we calculate other characters and things. but until the standard gets expanded to use all 32 bits, usually UTF-16 is a pretty good choice if you're going to be dealing with a programming language. And UTF-8 is going to be the only language of choice if you're using the web in modern times. So languages like Java and C-sharp will let you name variables in alternate languages, meaning that you need the character set to be able to express those languages. You want to have a variable named after, you know, King Tut's left toe, 
Well, there's probably a hieroglyphic for that, and you could do that. Now, one of the problems we have is these guys have 16 bits to store data in, and we need to be able to store 21 bits. So clearly, there are cases where UTF-16 is going to require more than one 16-bit grouping. When it does, it'll be the same size as the 32-bit one, so no, nothing lost when that happens. UTF-8, on the other hand, obviously can't contain even a 16-bit entity. We would need at least two bytes to contain that, and possibly more, three, four, or five bytes. We'll have to look and see as we go back and review that, whether or not we could stuff this number in UTF-8 into it in a reasonable number of bytes. Big end and little end and have to do with the architecture of the machine as you require. Remember, Indian is E-N-D-I-A-N from Gulliver's Travels. You can read about that online and you know, be amused about taking an egg out of your refrigerator and see which end you can sit it up on. I would suggest doing that on the Equinox because that's when it works the best. Okay. So let's encode this piece of data, this code point, in one of these encodings. So let's call these guys just so we remember this. These are Unicode encodings. Let's first of all encode it in UTF-32. Because basically we write the number down. And we need to have eight, characters, eight hex digits. Four times eight, you know, four, four bits in a nibble. We have eight nibbles. That should be our value. We have already done it. We've now encoded UTF-32, big end down. So our code point here fits nicely, but we got all this wasted space at the front end. Be nice if we could code it in fewer bytes. We know we're going to need this many bytes anyway for this particular character, even in UTF-16. But we, since we won't be writing most characters as astonished faces, most of it might be ASCII. Those will be done in less bytes. Let's now try to encode it in UTF-32 little India. Well, the only difference here is we have to take and we have to put them in in the order that a little Indian machine is going to be expecting them. Uh, let's see, it's F6. Zero, one, zero, zero. So the bytes happen in the opposite order. The bytes remain consistent. They stay left to right in the same order. The nibbles don't flip. We take the zero, zero that was here, put it there. The zero, one, put it here. The F6 here, the three, two, and put it here. This is UTF-32, Little India. Now, how would we know if we received a file and it was in Unicode, how would we know which ordering it uses? There is something called a byte order mark, a BOM. I'm not going to hold you directly responsible for that, but you probably want to read about it and you can, again, Best place to start since there's no tax is look in the Wikipedia. We know the Wikipedia is right everywhere, correct? No, it's terrible. But it does lead you lots of places. And by using it as a jumping board or a diving board type of thing, springboard, you'd be able to go look up the information you need, not just, you know, walk up to somebody with a question of, so I don't know, I never heard of a byte order mark. Well, by the time you ask that question, you should have heard of it. You should have looked it up. And then you'd ask a question which made sense, like, I understand the big Indianness of it, but why did they do X? So it would be a question which is based on understanding what a byte order mark is, not is a byte order mark something, you know, you get from a order to Dra Dracula? Yeah, no. Okay. We won't worry about that right now. We'll also see places where it's not used correctly out in the real world as we up to the semester. Next one to encode is UTF-16, both of its flavors. Well, UTF-16 has some interesting things once we get more than 16 bits. So first of all, let's say we had the number 1234 and we wanted to encode it. Let's assume that this is a code point 
and we want to encode it in UTF-16 uh, Big India. But all we would do is simply write it down. It's done. We want to decode it in UTF-16 Little India. We'd reverse the bytes. It's done. UTF-16 on its own is actually kind of easy. Problem we have is if we want to encode something which is ASCII, for example, the letter A, it's going to be 0041, and it's going to be encoded that way in Big Indian, or it's going to be encoded as 4100 in Little Indian, which we'll see is a problem with uh, UTF-16 if you're trying to save space, because most of the most of the internet is ASCII. Most of the documents you have on the web are either in something which is based on ASCII, like a Word document or something like that, or something which was using a subset of Unicode, which is in uh, ASCII. Here again, we have the same problem. Had we encoded this letter in 32, here's the big end in form. Here's the little end in form. Look at all those wasted bytes. We know later in uh, UTF-8, we can encode it as 4.1. So we'll get to that in a second, but be aware that sometimes these are space considerations. But the number we're currently working with right now and have in hand, which is 1F632, let's write that out in binary. Okay, I'm going to take the one and set it by itself, F6, 3, 2. Now, one of the things we do when we're going to be taking numbers which have more than 16 bits is we have to get rid of basically the 21st bit by making the potential biggest number the 20, uh, 20 bits instead of 21. So what we're simulating is, let's assume that we had the biggest number in Unicode, which is 1, 0, Zero F F F F. I'm sorry, one zero F F F F. We have 21 bits there. So if we just simply look at the first two digits and we subtract one from it, forget about these. What we're going to get is borrow the 16, subtract one from 16, and get. A, we put everything back. We've got a number now which is 20 bits long. So the bits we just wrote down here tell us we have more than 16, but we have to do the equivalent of this. We have to subtract this one away from a big number to make it fit in 20 bits. This already does, but if we didn't do this, this number would not. So we always, whether the number looks like it needs to or not, need to subtract away that leading one. Notice this is a 10,000 looking number. It's not 100,000 looking. We're not subtracting this one away. We're subtracting a one from the next position, which happens to be that character in this number. So the number we're actually encoding is F632. Now you might be tempted to take the number you have and simply write it down as a 16 bit entity because it's 16 bits long. The trouble is there could be a character at that that's not at this location, right? This is not a code point anymore. This was the code point. This is the piece of number we're going to work with. Now when we do that, we're going to be left with 16 bits. Well, in order for us to do the next step, we need 20 bits. But the other bits have to be zeros. So the bits we need fit in the rightmost 16. Now what we need to do is we need to take that as two pairs of numbers, both of them 10 long. I'm going to pull this down as the second part of the problem. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to rewrite this so that the nibbles are in sets of nibbles from the right hand end. Now, since I only have 10 bits, 
And the next step I'm going to do requires me to work with 16 bits. I'm going to stick six more zeros at the beginning. Now our number is ready and been conditioned in order to become a surrogate pair. Remember for the surrogate pair, the top number has to be added to D800. The bottom number has to be added to D Charlie 00. Okay. So let's write D8 0 0. Let's write it D Charlie zero zero. Now it turns out that bits will never line up on top of each other, meaning you're always either going to have a one or a zero coming down, never two ones lined up because of the way they pick the numbers. So I'm going to pull all the ones straight down in any column that has a one in it. One one zero one. One zero 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 one 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 zero one. That's the first surrogate, high surrogate. One one zero one 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 zero 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 one one zero zero one zero. This is the low surrogate. So let's write down what the high surrogate is. It's D eight three D. What's the low surrogate? D, E, 3, 2. Our final answer, D, e, 8, 3, D, D, C, uh, D, E, 3, 2. This is UTF 16, Big Indian. A little Indian, we only reverse them in sets of 16. So it'll be 3, D, D, 8. 3, 2, D, E. That's an example of working through a surrogate pair problem for UTF-8, meaning that we had to encode more than 16 bits. And when we do, we wind up encoding it as a pair, two, well, it's a pair of two 16-bit numbers. They will each be either big end or little end end, depending on what we have. Any questions? This is why you have to memorize these things. You can't just be looking at that chart trying to remember what 1101 is. Well, um, which of the, uh, which one of the ends is high? Uh, is the high end, you said? This is called the high surrogate. This is called the low surrogate. So when you're done, okay. the combination, the one with the D8 is the one that is the high end. The one that's with the DC, now it may not look like a C, C in the second position, but it's the DC one is the one that goes on the right-hand side. But then when we go to little end end, we have to flop the bytes around. Let's real quickly work this problem backwards. Because that's the, other, the more likely way you'd be seeing this on a test. Okay, let's say we took the problem we had, which is somebody said 3D, D8, 32 D8. They said, that's an encoding in UTF-16 Little India. What is the code point? Okay. So, in order to do this, somebody's got their microphone on. So what is the code point here? Well, we would first of all reverse it so it's in big Indian because we want to work with it in standard order. We would then take this number and we would subtract away the D800 on the left-hand side and the D Charlie 00 on the right-hand side. We haven't learned base 16 subtraction yet, so we'll write it out in binary. D8, three, D, D, 
E three two is every demo. E eight three D D E three two. I think I got them right. Okay, now since we know that D eight looks like that. And we know that D Charlie looks like that. We can simply bring down the ones that don't have a match. What did I do here? I did something wrong. Oh, this was uh, D8, so these should be zeros. So these guys come down as they are. Oops, I still wrote ones there. Okay, so when we're done, we take the leftmost 10 bits from this guy. take the leftmost 10 bits from this guy. Oops. Smooth them together. Break them back into their parts. Okay, now remember how we got this, where we got this from. We took, let's see, do I have them written up here anywhere? I guess I didn't write that number down. But once we've done this, you'll notice that we have the 20 bits that we needed. So let's write this back out in hex, just as it is, zero F, Six, three, two. And then we don't want to stop there. Remember, there was one more step. We had removed that number. But we need to add it back. I've been checking. I think this is the right answer, right? One F six three two code point. So that's how you tell you go from the encoding back to the code point. Okay, we're going to move ahead. New topic. We've been looking at numbers as having positional value. What if we threw in a decimal point and put some numbers to the right of the decimal point? Well, we know this is three, two, one, and zero, right? What are these positions? Well, this one here is negative, right? Negative two, negative three. Well, basically, this is the eight bit, this is the four bit, this is the two bit, this is the one bit. This bit is the one half bit. I can't write it like that and make sense out of it. So one half, one quarter, one eighth, one sixteenth. And the reason that works like that is that if I had the number two raised to the minus one, what you really are doing is it's one divided by two raised to the first, right? The minus sign throws it under a fraction, which is one half. So when we have a decimal point, it's possible to express numbers in binary as fractions in something called fixed point binary. We could do fixed point hexadecimal. The only difference is we have to make sure we're always working with four bit entities on the two sides, just so it's readable. But I could write down a number. If I were to write down the number, one 
point oh one but that's in binary you would tell me that number is equal to one and one fourth or one point two five think about that for a second why is that useful well we're going to study in another class something called floating point notation and coding and when we do that you're going to see that it is really really handy when you do things like multiplication and division but it's terrible when you want to do things like addition and subtraction fixed point is the opposite way fixed point is really good at addition and subtraction but it's harder to do multiplication and division because externally you have to keep track of where the decimal point went whereas in a floating point situation it will float the point for you so let's take a couple problems here and see if we can figure out what they might be what if I gave you this number right here? What would you tell me that number was? Why don't you write in chat what you think the decimal value of that is? I'm going to go to the other machine. Uh oh, something just happened. <laughs> I just got to, if I was involved with window app development, was I satisfied? Click this button. I think I'll wait on that. Okay, this is minus one, this is minus two, this is minus three. So minus two would be one fourth, this would be one eighth. So the answer is going to be something in eighths. How many eighths are in a fourth? Two of them plus one. So this number right here is equal to three eighths. Notice that zero I wrote in front of the decimal point. That'll be our standard to put one there if there is none rather than just starting it with a decimal. Okay, what if somebody said um, 13 sixteenths? Actually, let's do five and 13 sixteenths. Write that out in fixed point binary. Okay, five. We know that's 101, right? If we wrote it out as a hex digit, which we should probably in this case, point, now we need 13 sixteenths. This is halves, quarters, eighths, sixteenths. Well, very conveniently, that's the number 15 if we make it all ones, right? So the number of sixteenths, until we have another unit, goes from 0 to 15. So all we'd really have to do is write the number 13 in those four bits. 13 is a dog or a 1101. If we were to write that out in hexadecimal, we would have a five point dog. It would be an interesting looking beast. So that's not very hard. I mean, we really, that, that just kind of does itself for you once you realize that. Let's do one that's not going to be quite as pretty for doing. Uh, let's say somebody asks you to write 16, well, that's not 16, that, that is, 16 and uh, 5 eighths. So in binary, we know 16 looks like this. We need 5 eighths. So eighths will take three positions. Keyboard noise. 
we need to write the number five in there because two to the third is eight, so we could fill it up. So five would be one, zero, one. And now we need to condition it for uh, hexadecimal. To do that, we need at least another zero here so we get four bits. This guy, we already got four, but we need three more in front of him to make it comfortable. I'm putting a space here just to make it obvious where the break is. Wouldn't have to. So I would write down one zero dot alpha. And that would be our representation of that number in hexadecimal. Any question about that? Okay, give me a green light if you can hear me. Okay. Now we come to a bit of a problem, negative numbers. What if we wanted some of the numbers we were using to be negative? Well, one of the things we could do would be we could take and start the number with a zero or a one if we wanted it to be a negative number. So the first number there would be negative zero. The second number would be positive zero. I'm not too bothered by the fact that uh, these look different, but should compare the same. I think that's not too bad a thing, but it turns out that using this scheme is not algorithmically as nice as some other schemes. So if I were to use the number 10 this way, I would encode a, a, the negative number and then an eight and a two, and that would be negative 10. Positive 10, of course, would be the same thing, except we would not have the left number be a 1. So this exists and sometimes is used, and we'll see uses of it, but it's not the best way to do um, numbers, you know, when we need positive and negative. Now, we it use a little more complex way, but it turns out in the big picture of things, big scheme of things, to be a better, better way of doing it. The way we're going to do is something called two's complement. First of all, what's complement? Complement means invert the bit. So if I had these bits right here, and I said, give me the one's complement, you would simply reverse all the bits. If I said, give me the two's complement, what you're going to do is reverse all the bits or invert all the bits, and then add to it the number one. So this number right here would be the two's complement. This number right here would be the one's complement of this original number back here. The original number, you just flip all the bits, you get what's called the one's complement. If you then add one to it, I'll put a plus sign there, you're going to get the two's complement. Now, I'm not going to go over math heavily tonight. We're going to talk about this half of an entire evening. But if you're adding things up, you got just a few cases that can occur. One of the things is in the rightmost column of a pair of numbers, you're either going to be adding 0 plus 0, 0 plus 1, 1 plus 0, or 1 plus 1, assuming you have two values you're adding in the rightmost column. You're going to produce two outputs, however. One of the outputs you're going to produce, let's put it on the line above, is you're going to produce a sum. Why don't you put the carry first? You're going to produce a carry, or you're going to and you're going to produce a sum. So adding something in the rightmost column of a set of numbers. So let's say I was going to add 0101 to 1111. In the rightmost column, there's no carry coming in. So all I can do is add this plus this, generating a carry or not, and generating a one or a zero for the sum. So if I add zero and zero together, I'm going to get no carry, but I'll get and I'll get a sum of zero. 
if I had zero and one together, I could get no carry, but I get a sum of one. I had one and zero together, I get no carry, I get a sum of one. If, however, I had one and one together, I'm going to get two. Two won't fit in a single digit, so I have to have a carry and a sum of zero. So for two digits, right hand column, we actually call that a half adder. We'll call it more extensively when we implement one. But when we get to the second column, remember each of these also has this carry possibly coming in. So we really could be adding, you know, a carry plus zero plus zero. What we'll see is we're going to again produce as an output and result a carry and a sum. But the first thing we can think of is carry coming in, and then this is the top number, the bottom number. Again, this is zero. This is zero. In the case where we have only one one, we got a no carry, but we have a sum. Notice that that happens multiple places happens here, it happens here, and it happens there. What if we add two ones together with no carry? That gives us the number two. So we're going to get a carry, but no sum. And again, two characters happen multiple places. Finally, the last number says add carry plus a number plus a number. That gives us a three. A three is carry the two plus leave a one behind. So when we do addition, we have these cases. Notice in the rightmost column, we only have four things that can happen. In this other column, we have eight things that can happen. We'll learn later that we can implement this function. This carry function is simply an and of those inputs. The sum here is just simply an exclusive or of the inputs. And then we'll learn in down here things about it as well. For example, the first half of the carry is just an OR function. The second half is an AND, I'm sorry, an AND function. The second half is an OR function. This is an exclusive OR. This is an exclusive ZNOR. So we'll see that there's a lot of stuff built into this table, but we just needed that right now because in order to add that number in in the last position, we have to know how to handle that if we're doing it. So I'm going to take a number. And I want you to tell me what the two's complement of uh, that is. Well, we reverse all the bits. Then we're going to add one. So the final upside, I didn't write the same number down, 01. Yeah, I did, 0100, and we're going to add one. And that's our final answer. So whatever this number is, that's the negative version of it. This is negative because the first character is a one. So this number is a five. That must be a negative five. Okay, so let's enumerate in our table the numbers that we have in hand if we do this. I missed one in there. Did I get 16? One, deal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Yep. Okay. So let's just for the heck of it, let's do our algorithm to this guy. Flip all the bits. And then add one. Well, that's going to put us back to zero again, isn't it? Let's take this guy. Flip all the bits. 
and add one. Well, that's going to give us this. Flip all the bits and add one. Well, if we add one to this guy, it's going to create a zero there with a carry, and then a carry with this is going to follow through. So we're going to get a one, 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 zero. I'll flip all the bits and add one. And one of the things we'll look at is if you see these numbers right here, and you look at these numbers down here, we're growing toward the center. So we really don't need to look at these numbers at the moment. So let's get rid of those center ones. And let's just see one, one, zero, zero. I don't even need to do the second half because it's already folded back on itself. So this guy has to be that. That guy has to be this. So I'm just going to delete them for the moment. We've already got them accounted for. So let's look at these numbers. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That means we have eight positive numbers because this looks negative. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven, eight negative numbers. Zero is the same as zero, so that doesn't count. But notice that negative eight is negative eight. There is no positive eight. If we take it and reverse all the bits and add one, we get this. So we go one more in the positive direction because basically we gave zero through seven. We gave the zero to the positive side. And then we go from minus one to minus eight on the negative side. That again is eight digits. If we only have 16, you know, eight and eight, that's going to take care of all of the positions for us. So we've got ourselves an ability now to do a twos complement. We also are going to see that this turns out to be a very handy way to take larger numbers and make them be negative. Let's say I had, you know, just a simple that number. What do I do? Give me the ones complement. Then let me pop these over one so I can put a plus sign down here. And then we want to add a one. Okay. So to our new number we created, one and one we we learned is zero. Carry the one. So there was a one carried to right here. A one zero zero leaves a one with a carry of zero. So all the other carries are going to be zero. So in here now we can just simply fill in the rest of the numbers that we had zero one zero zero one zero. So whatever this number is here, we would have this number added to it. Okay, this is the number. It's the negative version of whatever that is. Okay, this guy should have been over here somewhere. Actually, that was an extra guy, wasn't he? Just hanging around. So we took this guy, flipped all the bits, added one, and we got a number. So we could look at this and we would see that that number here is eight plus two plus one. We know that to be a B, six. It's a negative number because that number's turned on. We see this guy here is a four alpha. He's the positive version of whatever number that is. Notice when you use positive and negative numbers, you lose half of them to the negative side. So that's why some languages have unsigned variables. So you, as long as you know they're going to be positive, you get twice as many variables because you have one more bit to store them in. Now, this is an easy way to do it. My, one of my ex students, his name was Eric Coakley invented a method years ago called the Coakley method of doing this. If I give you a number looks like that, what the Coakley method says and what Eric says is, if you want to get the twos complement, find the last one. 
keep everything that's after it the way it is. Okay, so we'll take this, put it down. Now, take everything that's in front of it and reverse those numbers. You do the other way, you'll find this is the twos complement of that. Just simply find the last one, keep it and all the zeros that follow intact, and just reverse everything that's in front of it. That's Eric Coakley method. Eric was one of my real bright students from years gone by, and um, he deserves to have his name mentioned every semester because he really did come up with this kind of on his own. And it's a really good way. It's also very, very handy if you're using a computer program to do the same exercise. Okay, what's next on my little list of things here? Anybody have a question at this point? Okay, I want to talk very, very briefly about something called binary coded decimal, BCD. If we restricted our numbers to the range 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 0, 0, 1, we would be using hex digits which match decimal digits. So if we wanted to, we could write numbers in hex like let's say we wanted to take the number three, two, three, four, five, and we wanted to simply use those so they were easy to convert into ASCII later. Well, it's easy to convert that into ASCII because if we took each nibble, we'd have 32, 33, 34, and 35. So turning it into binary, doing something to it and bringing it back out of binary doesn't always make sense. So in binary coded decimal, what we do is we take four bits and then we ensure that the number we store in there is always from zero to nine. So assuming this were a hex digit value, we would have stored Although it takes more than the binary would in terms of bit number, sometimes it's more handy to have it in a purely decimal form. So as you notice, we stored the number decimal two in a four bit entity. We stored the number decimal three, the number decimal four, and the number decimal five. This is called binary coded decimal. This is used a lot also with those seven segment displays you see on calculators and on uh, a lot of electronic equipment because in there very often you want to be working in decimal, maybe you're writing a calculator. Normally the calculator, the numbers you enter in decimal. So going into binary, doing some work and coming back out again is expensive if you didn't have to. And so that may show itself up somewhere along the way and you, you would want to make sure you kind of remember that it's there. Okay, let's switch gears here. Anybody have any questions about anything we've been talking about tonight? Because I am going to switch over to circuits now. Okay, hit the confused button just so I know you're, you know where it is in case you ever get confused. There you are. That's a confused bunch of people if I ever saw one. Okay, we're going to talk now a little bit about some of our circuitry. Okay, give me some room to write. With luck, I managed to get that tablet unplugged, so hopefully I'll be able to use the mouse and um, at least write as only as sloppy as my handwriting is on this screen. So here's a circuit consisting of a battery, which we've labeled V1, a resistor, which we've labeled R1, and a reference point we're calling ground, which in this circuit, we're going to consider to be zero volts relative to zero volts. Now this right might really, in the real world, be at minus 50 volts or at plus 20 volts. We're only using ground to reference in this circuit 
a point that we can call zero to which we can measure other points and know that's the reference when we don't mention another reference. Now, one of the things we can do is we can talk about what the law is that we're dealing with with this. So I'm going to hopefully be writing in some color here when I do this. Ohm's law, OHMS, or Ohm apostrophe S, Ohm's law, states that for a given voltage, there is a linear relationship between the current and the resistance. In our picture here, the current is flowing in this direction through the circuit. We'll label it as I. The A was used, so we can't use it again. And what we will be expressing with Ohm's law is given a point here as a voltage relative to another point in the circuit here, we know that the voltage that drops across the resistor, we'll say VR1, is equal to the resistance of R1 given in ohms times the current given in amps or amperes. So in order to solve this problem, we're going to need to have at least two of these variables or we'll be generating multiple solutions. So to start with, let's make the assumption that we have a five volt battery. When we say five volt battery, that means the top of the battery relative to the bottom of the battery is five volts potential difference. Now oriented in this fashion, it means that conventional current will flow from the plus around the circuit back to the bottom of the battery in that direction. We don't know current, we don't know resistance, so we still don't know enough to work the problem. What we can do is we can pick one of the two that we want to work with. Let's say that we needed to know or in our study that we needed this to be a 100 ohm resistor. Okay, now we know enough that we can solve for I. Now one of the things you can do is you can draw a circle. You can draw a circle around it. Cover the one you want to solve for. We want current. Cover it up. That shows the V over the R. So in case we've forgotten how to do the algebra, we simply divide the voltage by the resistance. Want to solve for voltage? Cover it up. I is next to R. That means multiply them. Want to solve for resistance? Divide voltage with I. So you can use this little mnemonic type of thing here to do it. In our case, we'll use a grocery store calculator. Very cheap one. Has to be cheap in order to only have those features on it. What we want to do is take and solve for I. We're going to solve for I. That means we divide the voltage by the resistance. The voltage is 5 volts divided by 100 ohms. The answer we get is 0 0.05 amps, capital A. So resistance is in ohms, volts are in volts, current expressed as I, but is in amperes. Now, when we express our answers, we want to use an engineering way of doing so, which means we're always going to put one, two, or three significant digits to the left of the decimal point. We're always going to move the decimal point in multiples of three. Now, I don't remember if I gave you the prefixes table last time or not. I believe we did.
So in our case, what we have to do is we have to get the decimal point such that this five and at least a second significant digit, well, that for our purposes right now, get this five to the left of the decimal point. That means we've got to move this over three positions, which means we're, we just have a missing zero there. So this is going to be 50 point something. Um, what am I looking at here? Prefixes there over here. So how do we move it in that direction? Well, we need to say that the number in amps has been made smaller, multiplied times 10 to the minus three, in order to put it into milli whatever units we want. So the answer we would express here is 50 milliamps. And that would be our answer that we would submit as a res result of working this problem. So the problem would be worked using volts, ohms, and amps. But at the end, when we get our answer, we're going to condition it so it's in the form an engineer would use it. So that there are two significant digits normally in the answer, maybe more, but usually two, uh, that the, the, they are to the left of a decimal point or uh, the significant digits are, but that we have uh, multiples of three in terms of determining what the prefix is for the units we're going to use. So let's work another problem and see if we can uh, start to, to actually we, we got a couple more parts to this we, we should really do. One is we need to know the power that's dissipated. And that, that formula was P in watts, the power in watts is equal to the current in amperes times the voltage in volts. So we know what the answer is and we already have it in our calculator in amps times the voltage, which is five. So 0 0.25, 0 0.25, this is watts. We, however, need these two digits, or at least we need one of these, which will bring the second one over. Move that over three positions, I mean, we have to add a zero. That means our answer is going to be 250 milliwatts. Now, if we were going to the store to buy this particular resistor, one of the things we're going to have to do is determine how much wattage does the resistor need to have in order not to get too hot and burn up our circuit? Our choices are going to be half watt, quarter watt, eighth watt. This would be 125 milliwatts if a eighth watt were safe. This is exactly a quarter watt. Therefore, we're going to call it unsafe. We're going to go and get this as a half watt device. So this device here is 100 ohms half watt in order not to overheat based on our power calculation. Now, there are a couple other things that we need to know about our resistor. One of the things is, if I go over to a box of resistors and want to pull one out and pick it out, how do I know if it's a half a watt? You don't. Only years of experience, or if the package is marked, will you know what the wattage is. However, you do get a sense and feel for it over time, and usually, well, 100% of the time, you'll get it right if you were doing this for a living. However, the resistors themselves are not marked in any way to, can, to tell us what their wattage is. They are, however, marked with a color code. 
Uh, no. And we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Okay. So we need to look at our resistor. Our resistor is going to look like this thing at the bottom. They're going to be three bands close to one end, then a gap, and then possibly another band. This band may not be there. Now, how do we read these things? The first two bands tell you the first two significant digits in the resistance. So a 100 ohm resistor would have a one and a zero. Then the multiplier basically tells you, and how many more zeros are there? So in 100, we've already used one zero, right? But it doesn't matter. This tells us how many more. So 100 would be one, zero, one. Do you understand why this is a one? It's because there's another zero after the 10 to make it 100 ohms. So in order to know what we're going to find out, we need to look up the color of each of these. A one is a brown. A zero is a black. So brown, black, one zero, following that is another brown. So we would have brown, black, brown. We go to our box, we'd find a brown, black, brown resistor. We would hook it up in our circuit. Now, the next thing we would run into with it is that the resistor isn't exactly the resistance that it says it is. It's fooling us. It's going to be within some tolerance. If there is a no band in the fourth position, it could be 20% high or 20% low meaning that it could be 80 ohms and it could be 120 ohms. It'll be marked 100, but it could be as low as 80, could be as high as 120. If this fourth band is silver, it could be from 90 to 110. And if it's gold, it could be from 95 to 105. Clearly, if it's a precision thing you need to do, you're going to want to get the higher, closer tolerance. Now, you can expect price-wise, cheap, not so cheap, expensive. However, in today's world, these really aren't that expensive relative to the value of maybe keeping it at 5%. But sometimes you don't need the precision. Sometimes you just need for the light bulb to be on. You don't really care. But one thing we do care about, and... Uh, yeah, I've already closed that window, so I'll have to do it differently again. But uh, this particular list of colors are basically, if you start with the R, it's Roy G. Biv. You know, you learned that in elementary school. These numbers, you should probably be able to figure out with, if I handed you a resistor what the value is without this chart. I mean, you don't have to memorize it 100%, but be close because... Problems like this, you know, come up. Somebody will say, well, the resistor I have is a, uh, I don't know, a four, seven with three zeros after, you know, 47K ohm resistor. What would that be? Well, you look at this, you know, it would be a yellow, violet. And because it has three zeros, there would be an orange. They'd say it was 10%, you say, and the fourth band is silver. So not having to look that up again is one of those things that's a lot handier to do. So one of the things that we had with the last circuit we were looking at is going to ask me to close this again. Oh, I didn't. Did it leave it open? I don't believe it did. No, because it made changes to it. One of the things we had done is, do you remember we had a current flowing through here? And we had a resistance of 100 ohms. And given the 5 volts we had over here, we had come up with a milli, what was it, 50 milliwatts, something like that, or milli, milliamps coming through. The problem was when we did all that, we came up with a wattage of 250 milliwatts. And if you recall, I said, if it is exactly a quarter watt and that's the value you're computing, that doesn't sound safe. The reason is, is because what if we had gotten the 20% resistor? This could have been as low as 80 ohms. So if this were 80 ohms, 
then we would have a voltage of five volts divided by 80 ohms. Our current would have been 0 0.63 or 63 milliamps, which when multiplied back times the voltage to get the wattage would have been way over that 250 and our, th our resistor would have gotten too hot and burned up. So that's why I went to the bigger wattage. Bigger makes it safer in this case. Now, you don't want to buy the biggest thing in the world because sometimes you want circuits to be smaller. And obviously this will be a smaller resistor. But I was thinking in advance that if this were a lower value resistor, then we would have had problems. The other problem could have been that this could have been as high as 120 ohms. Now, if it were 120 ohms, then we would have had five divided by 120, which would have been only 42 milliamps. What if we needed this to be higher than 42 milliamps? Maybe that number isn't high enough. Well, this would have been a problem. So we would have had to perhaps pick a resistor value that had 5% instead of 20% in order to get it a higher value. So we look at the lowest resistance it could be to determine what the worst power conditions are. And we look at the highest values to determine whether the resistor is gonna allow enough current to do whatever, our, for instance, if it was an LED, is it gonna be enough current to light it up? It might not be high enough. So there's some things you have to do in order to do that sort of work when you're working with a circuit. It's real world. We might have some other issues. We might say that this is 5% plus or minus 5%, plus or minus 10%. So there's some other things that we might have to work on if we were building a real circuit, but all of those will be very clear in a circuit you're working on a test because you'll be given enough uh, to, to get that problem done. Well, what resistors, let's say that I had determined for whatever reason that I needed a value resistor of 123 ohms. And I go down to Radio Shack and I say, uh, I want a 123 ohm resistor. I find one that's open. And the guy, he goes, you've got questions? We've got blank stares. And he'd have no idea what you were talking about, but you would see over in the corner, here's where all the resistors are. Well, 123 ohms, let's look and see if that's even available. It turns out, the resistors come in certain standard values. Uh, actually, let's do it this way. There it is. Okay. If we get a 10% resistor, the first two digits can only be those. So if we're buying 123, we're stuck with a 120. Notice all of these are at decade multiples, meaning there's a 10, there's a 100, there's a 1,000, which is a 1K, there's a 10K, there's a 100K, there's a 1 meg, there's a 10 meg. It's, well, actually, there's only a 1 meg, only goes up to 1 meg. We have some extra values if we'll go and pay more for a 5%. We have some in-between values. The reason is, is because if you go to a box and you randomly pull them out, you're gonna get all of the values that fill the gap between 10% higher than this and 10% lower than that. But up here, because we're only 5%, the gap is smaller. So there's some intermediate values. But again, we couldn't get 123, we'd have to settle for 125, and we'd probably buy a 5%. Now, if it were 120 uh, ohms, we know that one is brown, two is red, one zero is brown. So it'd be brown, red, brown. And we would take and we would measure it and we'd try, we'd probably buy a bunch of them and try to find one that's close to 123 so our experiment would work, if that were the necessary number. I'll post both this and the color chart because I think they're both uh, worth having at your disposal and working with. So one of the other things that you'll see, let me, uh, what is it called? Yeah. 
process for you. But remember when we write these numbers, we kind of get an automatic boost. If it has an orange band, see these three zeros here? That means whatever number you're working with is working in kilo ohms. We go another three right here, the blue. We're working in mega ohms. So those sort of things would be uh, worthwhile. Now, in the problem we worked a while ago, one of the answers I believe we got was something like 0.0625. One of the things we want to do as engineers is if we're asked to, and usually we will be, round it to two digits. So 0 0.063, and then when we specify it, move the decimal point three positions so we can say 63 milli, whatever it was, that was ohms. And again, I should be using an omega rather than an ohms, but I don't have that character. If the number we had 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 four positions on it, like an, another digit there, we're going to still round it to two. So this becomes a three, and those become the two significant digits, at least one of which needs to be to the left of the decimal point. Any questions about that or the, what we just did? Now, significant digits are a little bit tricky in order to determine them. How many significant digits are there in that number? Put it in chat. I'm going to go to my other machine here and see what happens. It should be two, okay? Leading zeros, as a rule, are not considered to be significant. This gives it its value, and the multiplier will give it its position. Now, if I had a number like this, how many significant digits are there? Again, throw it into chat real fast. Should say three because all the digits are significant. How would we express that number if we were asked to report it in our form of engineering, which is two significant digits and with the engineering uh, shifting of the powers? What would be 1.2? Whatever, you know, units it is. We use, because they're easy to write, amps. How about this? And throw it into chat, of course. This has a little bit of trickery to it. Part of the trickery, and this, this is a math thing, and there's some symbols for marking them that usually get ignored. So we're, we will continue to ignore them because you, you'll never see people use them consistently, except for a kid named Brian Windricke, who I had about 13 years ago, who was insistent on using them, which was fine with me. The problem here is we don't know whether that digit is the result of this digit having been rounded and then just another zero stuck on it, whether this number has been rounded from something that was in front of it, or whether this number is trying to tell us that all four digits are significant. In our world, it doesn't matter. We're only going to use two, so we would still leave this as 1.1 probably not displaying those two digits, although there's arguments to be made depending on how we got, if we measured the number or computed the number, sometimes it makes sense to leave them. So if I had this number, how am I going to express that using our notation? If we have two significant digits showing,
So we're going to do 120 micro whatever the units are, microamps. These would be milli. These would be micro. But since we ask for two significant, it's going to be those two. OK, so we kind of understand that you will do some problems. And certainly before we get to the exam, we'll make sure we do some. So you don't make you know typical mistakes that students say it says two significant digits and they give me three would, of course, be a wrong answer. Uh, let me skip that topic for now. And grab this guy right here. Whoa, not that way I'm not. Okay, looks pretty similar. We have a circuit, it goes from the top of the battery around to the bottom. Current flows through here. We're going to be asked some questions. And the questions generally involve us going to a box, picking out some parts, and then building a circuit. Since we're remote this semester, we can't do that, but we can certainly do all the calculations and things that would take us up to that point. And then, you know, next year you can come back and visit my class and actually build these things. So we got some simple stuff here, right? This wire from here, and I'll just mark it kind of heavy here, all the way to here have the same voltage relative to ground. That's zero volts. The voltage from right here to here have whatever voltage the battery is on them. So let's say the battery is 5 volts. So measuring this point relative to ground, I'm going to see 5 volts all along that piece of wire. Remember, wire in our picture has no resistance. It's all been lumped into a resistor. Now, going around the circuit, I have to get from 5 volts back down to zero volts, meaning these two resistors have to drop that amount of voltage, which means I have to have some unknown voltage in the middle of these because part of it will drop across this resistor, part of it will drop here. So I have this unknown. I don't know what the voltage is here. And again, the voltage measured here can be relative to ground or it can be relative to 5 volts. We can look at both measurements to understand what's going on in the circuit. This circuit is actually equivalent. Let me uh, shrinky dink this down just for a moment here. To if I had created a battery and I had a single resistor in it, this is the same battery. This is our ground. But I have a single resistor. I'm going to call it RT, standing for R total. Now it turns out that the current flowing through this circuit is identical to the current flowing through that circuit. The voltage is identical. This total resistance turns out to be equal to the first resistance, well, that's a big one, plus the second resistance. So this circuit is called a series circuit. The two resistors are in series with each other. Now, without doing any arithmetic here, let's assume that this resistor here has a value of A. 
And this value here also has a value of A. Given everything else we know about this circuit, what would we expect the voltage here to be? Write it into chat if you think you know. Come on, be brave there. Give an answer. Okay, well, if these are identical and they add up to something that's going to have the same current going through it, breaking them into two pieces means each piece should do the same thing, right? The two pieces of voltage that it's going to create are going to be equal because the current is the same and the resistance is the same. And V equals IR, so this voltage would get divided in half. So we'd really see 2.5 volts there. Those of you that said that, congratulations. But did you remember to say 2.5 volts relative to ground? Or did you remember to say 2.5 volts relative to 5 volts? Because it is relative to both. This is 2.5 less than 5 volts. This is 2.5 volts relative or above ground. Now let's assume for a second that I had a six volt battery here. Let's change our battery to six volts. And the resistance here is 100 ohms. And the resistance here is 200 ohms. I should write the ohm marker so we don't forget what units we're using. And we want to find out what voltage is right there. How could we go about doing that? And well, we know we could do it this way, but let's let's try to just think about the proportions of those two resistances. Write it in the chat if you think you know what the voltage would be. And let's say, in this case, relative to ground. Well, here's spoiler alert. If this is bigger than that, right? And proportionally, this is twice as big as that. Wouldn't you expect for twice as much to drop there as here? Since 2 plus 1 is 3, wouldn't you expect 2 thirds of it to drop across this resistor and 1 third to drop across that resistor? What would 2 thirds of 6 volts be? It would be 4 volts here. Oh, there's zero volts here. So four of the volts drop there. Two of the volts drop across this guy. There's a two volt drop there. So six minus two gives me four. Four minus, you know, the four that would drop here give me zero. So that should make reasonable sense to you. So proportionally, we can determine how much is going to drop across these when they're in series like this by basically doing something called using a voltage divider. This is a voltage divider. And what we saw is the drop of these is relative to which one you're interested in, but they have to add up to you know, some value. So if I made these I'm running out of room in this picture. I may have to reload this. But if I made these so that, you know, a fifth of it dropped here and four fifths of it dropped here, you could expect to do that to the voltage. I use happened to use six volts here, so the math came out nicely. But it would still be proportional to what we're doing. 
So let's go now and let's look at this problem in terms of what we just did. We don't know what the current is. We do know that the current through both resistors is the same. We know that we have a 100 ohm resistor here. We have a 200 ohm resistor there. Because we've computed the voltage drops across each, we have enough to work the problem. We can say that 2 volts, V is equal to an unknown I times 100 ohms. So that just basically says 2 volts divided by 100 ohms equals the current. So we grabbed this, we can say 2 volts divided by 100 ohms. Oops, I hit the wrong key there. What did I say, 5 volts? Oh no, 2 volts. divided by 100 ohms equals 20 milliamps. Okay. Now what if we'd taken this guy, 4 volts and divided 200 in it? we still get 20 milliamps. This is the same 20 milliamps as I told you, going through both. It also says that if I added 100 and 200 together and did 300, and this is six volts, right? So if I took the six volts and I divided it by the total, I still see that I have 20 milliamps. So whether we combine them and work the problem and then back into this, we could work individual parts of it. We should be able to come up with an answer relatively quickly with something like that. So what color is a 100 ohm resistor? Let me see real quick here if I can. Hold on just a Let's see one thing here. Uh, go to the website for a second. And refresh it. And there should be your color codes now. So we need 100 ohms and we need 200 ohms. What are the color codes for those? One hundred is brown. I use BR for brown. Black BL. No BK, because blue would be confusing. That brown black. We have one zero. That's a brown. And then we have the other band. Well, we need to look now to see. Is 100 ohms available? Um, under the standard resistor values. And of course, one zero is, and it's available as 5% or 10%. Just for the purposes of this problem, 
Let's pretend like we got 10% resistor. Okay, so we got a brown, black, brown, silver. We'll do the same thing with the 200 ohm resistor. First of all, let's look to see if such a thing exists. Oops. 200 doesn't exist as a 10%, but does exist as a 5%. So we'll get a 5%. So the 200 ohm will be a 5% resistor. What's its color code? Two is a red, black is a zero, one zero is a brown. And then we need 5%, which is a gold fourth band. We need these to be quarter watt resistors. Where, how is that marked? The answer is it's not. You have to just know from experience. Now, how do we know what resistor and what current we have to check in order to see the, uh, whether it's safe or not? We need to take the smallest resistor who's going to be passing this current, and we need to take it so that it's at its smallest value. We pick this guy to be a 10% resistor, so he could be as low as 90 ohms. So six volts divided by 90 ohms equals 67 milliamps, multiply back by the voltage, which is six volts. Actually, I did that wrong. Okay, I did that wrong. Let me undo that. And can anybody quickly tell me in the chat why I did that wrong? Okay, the reason is, is because I use the entire six volts. Remember, this resistor is only seeing two volts. So we said it was 10% less, that's 90. So we're going to take two volts divided by 90 ohms, meaning that we've got a 22 milliamp current in the circuit for that. And because of that, this number is significantly less in terms of just determining this one value than we had before, but we could go ahead and multiply it back times two and see that that's less than 125 milliamps milliwatts, I'm sorry, so it uh, would be safe even at an eighth. So the quarter watt we asked for is definitely safe. Probably a good exercise to do would be to take this resistor, the total resistor, use it at its lowest value, assuming the worst, which is a 10% value, and see if it's still a safe value. So there's some checking and some things we might do given individual cases. The 200 only sees a drop of four volts, so we only have to worry about that at this current. This guy only sees two volts at that current. However, the entire circuit is powered by six volts with that current. So that would be something that we'd need to consider when looking for safe. Okay, assuming that I had, um, I don't want that, I want this. Assuming that I had a resistor, which I computed to be that value, how would I write that with prefixes and what would its uh, value, color value be at 10%? So go ahead and do that. Write the color value in the chat. Also give me a green light if you can hear me. Okay, good. My window had auto closed on me there. I was a little nervous. Yellow, 
violet. Oops. So we know a four is a yellow. Violet. How many zeros? Three, so we need an orange. And I said 10%, so it's silver. Now, how would we say this resistor's name? We would call it a 47K ohm resistor, 47K ohm. And the K could be lowercase. It's reasonably acceptable to use the uppercase as well, but need to be consistent. So what is the lowest value this resistor could possibly have? That means what the value it would have when it has maximum current. Well, it would be 47, whoops, minus 10% of that. So what's 10%? 4700? Zero, zero? We didn't know that. What could we do? So 47,000 zero, 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 times 0. 0.1. So what do we get for a value there? I can't do that in my head. So this could be all the way as low as 42,300. How high could it be? Well, 4,700 plus. 47,000. Maybe 51,700. So that's the general idea. Now, we would use these in calculations because remember, we're using ohms, volts, and amps in calculations. We're using things like this and the micro and uh, milli and all those when we're specifying them with engineering notation. We would keep all the digits during our calculation. It wouldn't be to the final answer that we had trimmed them off to uh, significant digits. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Okay, so the things we've added kind of make sure you have is you've memorized your powers of two from zero to 16. Remember, they also work as the negative power. So if somebody asks you what, you know, one thirty second is, you should know the how to do the powers on the right of that fixed decimal point as well. Wouldn't hurt to learn your color codes, although you can just leave them in the back of your head while you're memorizing the rest of the stuff. Make sure you know that nibble table so when we're flying through those nibbles, you don't get lost trying to figure the difference between a D and a B. You know, a lot of people, they don't, they don't catch a train early enough, and so they you know, have to sit in the back. We need you to be able to uh, get out of the caboose, you know, get up front with uh, normal passengers and in the dining car if you can. Okay, so do I have anything else that I wanted to cover tonight in my list? I'm looking at the syllabus right now. Uh, we did have one other thing tonight that I'm not going to get to, and well, two other things, and I'll do those on the, during the next class. It doesn't matter. Okay, anybody have any final questions? Then I, what is today? Today's Monday. I will see you folks on Wednesday. You all have a nice time until then. Why don't you jump on and tell me goodbye as you're leaving? Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.